Hello there, welcome back to the Yellow Turbans Abridged. Last time we decisively defeated a whole load of Wu armies, including the one with Sun Tzu himself, and then we started the process of auto-resolving our way towards their capital. We were stalled because even more Wu armies showed up, so we haven't made that much progress, but now we're going to change that. We were having some success against Shi Hui, we auto-resolved tons of their territory last time. And now we have actually finally seen a couple of their armies over there, but I'm just ignoring them. I'm going to keep trying to auto-resolve their territory because I just don't care about Shi Hui. One of the armies that was fighting him is actually going to transfer to invading Wu from the south or the southwest. However, there was a Shi Hui ambush on the road from our territory into the Kingdom of Wu from this direction. Completely unexpected. This is a real surprise. So now we have to get ambushed by these guys. Luckily it's not actually a full army, they're missing some units and most of the units are low level, whereas our army is quite veteran. When you get ambushed, it actually does give the player a little bit of a handicap because when the battle starts you're stuck in this camera, even in the replay as well as you can see. You can't give orders right away like you can as the attacker. So eventually, the game gives you control, but you could see there the enemy units were already moving. The battle had already started before you get control. And with only about one second before the units made contact, all we can really do is just get attacked. Sometimes that's okay, sometimes it's not. Interestingly though, the front and back of our column weren't really attacked, so we were able to form up two groups not involved in the ambush, and those will be key. Now we can start working our way through this mess to try and sort these situations out. We do have some problematic cases though, sometimes our archers were in melee, and I think in one case we lost a whole load of infantry to enemy cav, you can see it over here actually. They did get a full charge, they just went right through our yellow turban warriors and they were destroyed, so that unit was very correctly employed in the ambush. A shame, however, as you can see, having archers at the front and back of the column not be engaged means we can start picking off enemy units and begin to solve this right away. I gave their officers quite a few arrows. One of the generals that attacked at the start actually fled towards the edge of the map. You might be able to see them on the minimap making their way off. And the others who were nearby are getting cut down to size by the archers. Other archers here who are out of ammo can still be used to just charge random groups and get the attack from the rear penalty going and stuff. But what we're really going to do is use the fact that we did have a couple of units of cav who weren't caught up in initial ambush to just go around and start hitting enemy units from the rear. Even anti-cav units like the spear guards can be killed from the rear in this fashion. They've got some nice big blocks of vulnerable two arrows spearmen who are going to form up to attack with their archers. Here's an officer who's come back into the melee but is going to be cut down by the fact that we're actually taking control of the centre now. We have lost some units and quite a few men, but the enemy are getting the worst of it here. Their ambush wasn't complete enough. Perhaps half of our army in total wasn't ambushed because of the specifics of the formation, so we're getting away with this. Now we can do some juicy stuff, like using our archers to shoot the enemy spears at point-blank range. It's really janky because when skirmish is on they keep trying to move away, <laughs> I was too close in that case. But look at this, we can get some nice exposed shots onto those spearmen. Curiously it didn't do that much damage, I expected the enemy to be wrecked here, but they are tanking the arrows a little bit. It's possible that in this game there's no power upgrade or no power increase for being really close to the enemy. There is the enemy commander who died after she ran off as mentioned and I sent some calf to chase her down. And with this, pretty much everything has chain routed and we end up winning the battle. It went on for a while because one of the officers was unbreakable, had to kill his bodyguards. But there we go, we end the ambush with a close victory. The enemy ambush has failed and luckily enough this ambush was in our territory, they did it on our side of the line. So now we can stand here and take replenishment. So even though we lost like two-fifths of our army, we're going to get one-third replenishment, which, which will take us up back to pretty much full strength, if you also take into account the fact that I used the recruit option after the battle. So we will be fine, except for the fact we lost a couple of units who we'll have to wait for. We'll just stand here and carry on next turn. The survivors of that enemy army are still there, so hopefully we can chase them down in a bit. Let's go back to the main attack, which is coming down from the north. 
Last time I killed a whole load of armies here and looks like there were some survivors we needed to finish off. There they go and with that we can now stream into Wu's territory. To the south of here is Changsha, one of their core territories which is then next to their capital territory of Lingling which is what we're going after. Shi Hui gets himself, or gets some of his troops I should say, stuck in an ambush so we're taking some revenge for them ambushing us. I had left some guys behind some random trash just to ambush the path where I had seen their armies just to see if they would fall into it and they did. They're not going to try and stop me attacking them, they're trying to attack me and now they've paid the price. We take out most of one of their armies, we also take that city we besieged at the start of the part, some random city on the south coast. There's still plenty more Shi Hui territory to the east so we'll continue with our march from those guys. But we also need to finish off their invasion of ours and after one army was ambushed I can night attack the other one, they're both in force march which may or may not actually contribute to a disadvantage in order to resolve but basically they lose. Capture some guy here or execute him because he's too high level, take the recruitment and now we've got two half dead Shi Hui armies, that's all that's left. And obviously I can move on and just order resolve them to death, I won't bother showing that, it happened basically. Now. The army that ambushed us earlier unfortunately has disappeared by the time we advance to try and take revenge. But that's okay because we're not really here for them, we're here to take the Wu territory at Sang Wu, so we'll just carry on for that. Also we're now ready to go with this Changsha stuff so let's start moving. We've got three stacks in the area to head on in and there is actually a Wu army sort of defending Changsha. It's slightly far away so it can't reinforce the city, not quite sure why it's standing in that specific place. Guess it thought I would take the long road and go around those mountains to go at Changsha from another direction, but I didn't obviously, so instead we'll go right for the city now. Jiang Kai comes in to start the siege, as usual we'll have to wait a turn to get around before it lets us all to resolve that tiny garrison to death. Even though the city is max level by the way, it still has a small garrison, it seems it just makes your garrison small but strong, unless you actually build the garrison specific build chain to give you some extra units. As you might have seen there, I decided to have my reinforcement army randomly just ambush where it was standing, thinking maybe the enemy will walk into this, and they did. I didn't really expect that to work, but they went for it, and the ambush technically included Jiang Kai as well, so we just absolutely annihilated a full stack of Wu troops. Then the Duchy of Zhang is back at it again. They randomly declare war on us, and they actually already had a stack in our territory by the looks of things, so we immediately lose the farmland that we stole off them in a previous peace negotiation. So now we have to deal with that threat potentially. I do actually have some troops up in the Nanyang area to the north who will be able to resist if we get invaded. I've also recruited a few random guys to go and attack Jiangsha, which is to the east of the place we took from Wu earlier to the north of our main attack vector as you can see there. Just for no reason, I thought we probably can do it so we'll just steal something up there as a distraction. Back with the main show though. Time to take this city. We waited our turn, let's have it. It's annoying that this place isn't actually Wu's capital, their capital is some random place to the southwest in the mountain. It's not sure how their capital is out there and not like in Wu's starting area, which I think is to the east. Not quite sure what's going on. But anyway, we take this place, we lose tons of food because it's such a big city, and interestingly, you actually get the choice of what to do with the captured garrison, which you usually don't. It's usually just unanswered what happens to captives after siege battles, but in this case you actually did get the choice and I'm taking some recruitment because that's always good for just blitzing. Also, there's a Yellow Turban Rebellion here. They were so impressed at how we're killing all the Wu guys, they've decided to rebel themselves, but we're not having that, so we quickly kill them as well. Nearby to the west, we're gonna take that Sang Wu livestock farm, which is handy actually, because this helps counter the fact we lost all our food for taking Cheng Sha's imperial city. We're also gonna go for the tea house to the south of Cheng Sha, it was undefended, so one of the stacks I brought down goes to handle that with no resistance. The other two armies are going to head to the southwest, and I can do this because I've actually got military access with the Han Empire who control part of Changsha here. Not sure when I got that, but I'm actually on really good terms with the Han Empire. I think we're trading as well and have non-aggression. So for some reason the Han Empire, the guys who should like me the least, actually do like me. Handy. I ought to resolve that city. Jiangsha and lose a whole bunch of guys but it doesn't matter too much, we've just taken the city to be annoying. 
And again, there's a Yellow Turban Rebellion here, so we'll have to fight them, but they're weaker than the force I have here, so no issues with that. Looking around, I spotted an interesting little fact. Sun Quan, who is the historical ruler of the Kingdom of Wu, has been kicked out of Wu for some reason. His brother Sun Tzu rules instead, and he is sitting here in the Han Empire, curiously enough, defending their capital in some little backwards nowhere place. So not sure what happened to him. Things are clearly going very poorly for the Sun Dynasty. They're about to get worse because we are here facing Sun Tzu at our objective, the city of Ling Ling. So we move on in. I'm going to go at first for a double ambush strategy, basically. I'm going to put both of these stacks in ambush on the road just outside because the city is strongly garrisoned and Sensu's main force is here, so just looking for some kind of advantage rather than powering on in and having a very difficult siege to deal with. Nearby, Xu He goes north from that Sangwu farm to attack the toolmaker of Wu Ling. There were loads of guys here, so we only just had an advantage on the balance bar, but it was enough, gives us a victory, and our losses will technically be nothing by next turn. Our two armies who are fighting Xi Hui moved down the coast and now they've found a fishing port belonging to the enemy so we'll take that off their hands thank you very much the army at Jiangsha takes out the small yellow turban rebellion and that's the end of them and with this army i'm going to go after the Jiangsha farmland just because i can the only problem is we're not going to have enough men to actually do it right now so i decided to try and recruit some guys and it was now that i realized i've actually got a couple of free officers before I had no officers at all, so I couldn't deploy armies, and that was a problem. But now that I have some officers, I'm going to not only expand that army, but start a new one up in Luoyang, so that we can fight against the Duchy of Zhong up here. So just mentioning that, because we'll be following these guys later. And just to mention it, because you might wonder why I've got so much money and I'm not spending it on armies, it was because I just don't have enough commanders to lead them. I could easily have way more troops than I do. There, there was a little rebellion over in the west and they just instantly died, so that was the end of that, that was very handy. The stack that took the Changsha Tea House moves east from there into the commander Yu Zhang and takes a random rice paddy from Wu, so that's handy. Next, we're going to go back to our main attack on Ling Ling, where obviously Sun Tzu didn't come out and fall for the ambush, so we're going for something more direct. I'm laying siege to the city, and now I can see their garrison properly. It's pretty hefty, it's full of what I presume are endgame units, the protectors of heaven, the defenders of earth, guys armoured head to toe, some serious opponents. I'm settling in here for a long siege. You saw I put quite a few siege equipment things in the queue, because I thought we're going to need the enemy city to be in terrible condition to make this not a slaughter as we go in against all those elite troops and a really high level settlement. The thing was, I actually had reinforcements on the way in the form of Xu He. He's going to be here in a couple of turns. Seeing that, I thought, let's actually not start the siege, because I was pretty sure if I started the siege, the enemy would look at the balance bar, go, that's good enough, and just sally right away. But if I just stand outside, we can ignore each other for a bit in principle, and I can wait for Shu Her to show up. Then we can start the siege without the enemy automatically sallying, and I will have time to do things like undermine the walls and get some rams together for a nice big siege attack where things won't be so slaughterous for us. Hopefully, anyway, that's the plan. Back to Jiangsha farmland. I've got some guys together now to go in to make this attack. Got a little bit of an advantage on that balance bar, so we'll just take that. But actually, when it says it's a Pyrrhic victory, this time, they weren't joking. They actually uh, killed pretty much all of our guys as we take this farmland. That was serious business. They will obviously come back, as you can see here, so in a couple of turns we'll be fine. But in this specific case, there will actually be some disadvantage to those guys being dead soon enough, as we'll see later. Or probably in the next part, actually. I'm also going to attack the Duchy of Jong. You might have noticed they're not attacking me in all these turns. I'm just skipping past. They only took that farmland from us and then just sat there, so I'm setting up now to go and try to take the farmland back just to get something happening in that war and progress it in some way. As for finishing off Xi Hui, their last territory is actually off the coast of China. I guess that's down in Hong Kong as it is now, so we're going to sail out with a sack to go and try to take them down. There's loads of difficult terrain to pass over, so it will take a while, but we're nearly there with Xi Hui. Sun Tzu comes to us offering a peace deal. They'll give us loads of money and stuff, that's nice, but 
because the game is specifically now to kill Sun Tzu, getting peace with him is just equivalent to giving up. So we might as well keep playing and be at war with him. And actually, we do get attacked. It's a little bit hard to see what's happening here, but what it is, is Sun Tzu attacked the second army in the area, so the one that doesn't have Chiang Kai. But that army is an encampment stance, so we've got an encampment battle where we're facing everything from the enemy garrison and Sun Tzu's army, the decisive battle will be right now. This suits us quite well because we have the encampment on our side, we can use the towers that come with it to do some damage to the enemy's early attacks. It does mean we're going to be far away from our reinforcements, that's the only downside. So potentially we can be swarmed and if the camp is lost early on, things will get messy. So, just need to hold our ground and hope we can do the traditional tower exploits. One thing that will help us is that the enemy don't have many ranged units. So they're attacking in melee and they're running into our heavy spears who I've positioned just in front of the towers. So this is the ideal setup for the tower exploits. Plus, as you can see on the minimap, one of their attack groups went backwards to link up with their reinforcement, so we're not under that much pressure as the battle starts. We can just stand here, let the enemy fight our heavy spears, and use our archers to gradually kill them. In this case, I'm shooting arrows out at their officers, including Sun Tzu, who is hanging around here at the northern approach, and we do big damage to them. They've got some crossbows here who were causing a nuisance and killing many of my heavy spears. However, I've now got my reinforcement army charging over to take part in the fight. And the first thing they're going to do is ram right into those crossbows. The crossbows turn around to shoot, but that's not going to help in any way. We've now got like four or five units of cav leading the attack. So the crossbows just disappear. And Sun Tzu here, while being a powerful character, won't be able to hold out because we've got Jiang Kai who's good as well and just sheer numbers who so will get him in melee and since he's already damaged that's not going to be a problem. The attack on the western side of the camp is going well for us, they're not killing us fast enough. Our towers are gradually taking these guys out and now our cav will be able to go around and rear attack them as well. First we want to rear attack the group in the north obviously since it's closer, so we go in there and get that going. Sun Tzu has routed by this point and I've got one officer chasing him off the field. There were some protectors of heaven here, potentially units that could stop our cav attack, but they did rout, so we're able to get away with this. And the northern area is totally secured. And those cav go on to do the same in the west as well. And while I was microing that, from the south, the enemy reinforcement army now creeps up. And they've got all of those elite troops, including elite archers. Those archers proved to be extremely powerful. That was one volley. I just lost half a unit instantly. I didn't even see this when I was playing because I was microing other things. I've left this unit of spears here to defend this approach, thinking that'll buy me some time. But no, the first volley kills half of them. Then a few more arrows come in and kill the rest. And that's the end of that. They seem to be firing some kind of explosive arrows. They seem to be a bit more than just fire arrows. So we're cleared out. The side of the fort there is on fire, so we're going to lose our towers and the enemy are now pouring through the gate. The only upside is that it looks like these elite archers have managed to set the forest they're in on fire with their attack, so they'll now lose men due to the fire damage. Very handy. But yes, things are now getting bad and this is where I noticed there was a problem when I actually looked back and saw my lines of archers getting slammed by the enemy's cav. At least a lot of my archers are the men of the forest, the melee type, who can resist now that the charge is over. But overall, not an ideal situation, and we now need to very rapidly start repositioning all of our troops to deal with this incursion. You might be wondering, though, how I'm still alive. If those super OP archers fired at us again, we'd be dead. So far, they haven't fired at us again, and now I'm attacking with all the cav I can muster to try and just keep them from firing. We take out some regular archers on one side of this rock, and on this side, here we go. We've got the defenders of the earth locked down in melee or just skirmishing away from the cav, so we'll keep going after them. It's pretty dangerous because they do have a whole load of the protectors of heaven here as well, who can easily cut down our cav, but it's worth it. We need to stop those defenders firing because we just die. Our men are all grouped together, and with their explosive-like shot, we'd probably just get leveled. Since we have got them essentially out of the ranged fight without using very much of their ammunition, 
We are going to have a much better time of it, I think. Because while the enemy's heavy infantry are still better than mine and they're hacking their way into the camp, we have a lot of numbers so it's going to take the enemy a long time to make progress. And in that time, we're taking out the enemy's archers unit by unit. And since they have been unable to fire, they haven't contributed very much to the battle. And now that the enemy have lost so many units, the enemy's army morale is going to start dropping. Still having trouble with these glaive infantrymen taking out my cab, but by spamming orders, I'm trying to stay away from them. And here I finally just commit some archers to go stand here and fight with the enemy's glaives. They're not going to have a very good fight, but it distracts the enemy, allowing us to finish off the enemy archers, which is the all-important target. And at this stage, as you can see with the broad view, all those archers are routing or dead, so it's just the melee troops left to kill. Easier said than done, because while they do have some units of like random sabers in there, who we can kill, the heavy glaive troops, well that's another story, I'm charging them in the back here with my light infantry, which doesn't really do anything. One thing that is sort of effective is just spamming arrows, and we do have a lot of archers right here. Our reinforcement army had like 10 units of archers in it, so we've got plenty of arrows to use. And regular archers do have armor-piercing damage, just not as much as crossbows. So by raining arrows on the melee, we can gradually pick up kills. I'm sure some of our guys in the melee got the odd kill here and there as well. Just doesn't really look like it. And after a while, after inflicting some more damage, everything still in the fight suddenly routes and we get away with this. The enemy have lost a whole stack and a bit more, so it's easy to get them on army losses now, as mentioned earlier. So off they go and suddenly we win. I want to chase them down now because this is the garrison of the city. If we can kill them here, then the whole battle for the capital will be over. As we have seen in previous parts though, killing these heavily armoured troops is difficult because it's hard to kill routing units even at the best of times due to the lack of attack animations. And with heavy units that just don't die even occasionally when the attacks go through, you can't really get them. So after a minute or so I just gave up when I realised I wasn't killing any of them during the routes. But Things have still gone well. It's a close victory and Sunsa and his army are toast. Sunsa is still alive but the rest of the army is just gone and lots of the garrison did die as well, in particular the archers. So we're going to be left with an auto resolve basically. We won't have to worry about those OP archers taking us out as we assault the walls or anything like that. Once it's our turn again, we start the siege, and there's really nothing in there. Sinsa is wounded by the looks of things, but he'll be okay again by the time we're ready to attack. But with no troops, not much he can do in that situation. In the meantime, let's sort out some other business, and here is why I said that Pyrrhic victory we suffered earlier could be a problem. We're going to be attacked at Jiangsha by another Wu army that's appeared around here. And since half of our units, or much more than half of our units, are dead, we don't have much to defend with. I decided to still commit to the defence, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to have my army stand outside the city. That way, when the siege starts, it has to last at least one turn. And in one turn, all of our units outside the city will be able to replenish and respawn. So with this plan, the longer it takes the enemy to attack, the stronger we'll get, the opposite of a usual siege. And actually, that will be quite an effective measure for defending that area, as it turns out. I also randomly took some territory from the Duchy of Zhong with that army I raised at Luoyang that I mentioned earlier. And also with the Duchy of Zhong, the army I sent to attack Chen has just been ignored by the enemy. So I decided to try something. I encamped just on the edge of the zone of control of the settlement. That means if the enemy attack me, the settlement's garrison will come in and make the balance bar be in the enemy's favour. So they're willing to go for this fight and indeed, as we can see here, they do challenge me to this battle. I'm going to skip over this one because it's kind of a less interesting version of the battle we just saw and I want to get on to what happens after this battle because it's much more important. So this clip is going to be representative of what happened. We stopped the enemy in front of the towers and the towers killed them and they did have lots of archers but they sent Cav out to kill them as well. With those two measures, that's really all we need to worry about. They did have some fire archers who took down one side of the camp over here, so some men have made it inside, but that's not going to be enough to do any sort of serious damage, and we do take them out. Here we are after the battle. 
So they're all dead, and since the garrison of the town came out and died as well, we can easily just attack the town in the next turn of the town, the farmland, you know what I mean? And have that as well. So now we've reclaimed our territory from the Duchy of Jong. We are officially winning that war as of now. And here's the auto resolve you really wanted to see. We auto resolve Ling Ling. Sun Tzu is out of there, he dies in the battle, and as it says here, we've captured an emperor seat. So this is one of our victory regions, we have it now, but taking it doesn't do quite what I expected, actually. First we have to hack through this thing about someone else taking over the kingdom of Wu, the Sun Clan is out of there now, even though Sun Quan is still alive. And then it says that we are now challenging for the throne. So what happens, apparently, is that once you've taken down one of the Imperial Challengers, you just become one yourself. And I thought we'd be here just to like burn down the entire thing, because remember we are the Yellow Turbans, the game's forgotten it. We're here to overthrow the system, but uh, apparently we're actually just going to become the system. I'm very disappointed in Jiang Kai for forgetting his revolutionary principles here. So now we get to choose who the new Emperor is, and we do have the option to choose ourselves, that being Jiang Kai. You get a different bonus based on what choice you pick, but Jiang Kai's is by far the best. Look at our income right now, then look at it after I pick Jiang Kai as the Emperor, it doubles. It's because it reduces our upkeep costs across all of our armies by some amount, and that adds up to quite a lot. So that's looking good. Jiang Kai is now the Emperor of the Yellow Turbans, didn't see that coming, but he's going to be a benevolent and very peaceful Emperor, etc. So maybe it's okay that we're kind of replicating the thing that the Yellow Turbans rebelled against. They might not notice that this is happening to them, and we can carry on. So yes, at this stage in the campaign, the Yellow Turban DLC campaign has just converged completely with the regular campaign. We've actually unlocked all the diplomacy, and we're just a normal faction for all intents and purposes. There is no Yellow Turban themed way in order to complete the campaign. So we carry on. We're still at war with the Kingdom of Wu, and we're going to have to take them down some more because they're still really powerful. We can't just march off and try and do the victory objectives right now because we'll probably lose Ling Ling again. We need to hold on to the area with a few stacks or something. So yes, we've got some more to resolve to set up and the destruction of Shi Hui to get on with. But at least we have made a definitive step of progress in the campaign. While there may still be three kingdoms out there, there is only one true empire. The Yellow Empire has like half the country at this stage, and we're just a few auto resolves away, really, from making it quite a lot more than that, and finally moving into the very end game.